you do. Who is he? That's my partner, but he no speak. Oh, that's your silent partner. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast, episode 48, Your Silent Partner. Hello, Marx fans, Noah Diamond here, and it is, let's say, uh, late June, early July 2022 as we speak to you, which means that we are eh, a couple of weeks, give or take, from the eagerly anticipated publication of Susan's book. That would be Speaking of Harpo, the memoir written by Susan Fleming Marx, who died in 2002. The book has been edited and given an afterword by Robert Bader, along with a foreword by Bill Marx, and is available July 15th. What we know about Susan's book is that we're going to learn things we didn't know before from someone who is clearly one of the most articulate and opinionated witnesses to a big part of the Marx Brothers story, but who isn't really heard from in much detail in any previously available source. So, in anticipation of this expansion, perhaps, of our understanding of Susan and her husband, we thought we'd better do our Harpo episode now. We are considering a very great artist who, by abstaining from spoken words, transcended them. One of the things he showed us is the failure and the folly of talking. And who better than the three of us to prove his point? My co-hosts, here they are now. Let's have a beautifully written introduction for Matthew Conium. Uh, Well, from him. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Say, I could use a guy with your nerve. (laughs) And here is a witty and sweetly affectionate intro for Bob Gassell. Wait, wait, we're not talking about Go West anymore? What the hell is going on here? (laughs) Uh, My friends, I, I always... Feel like we uh, we're always looking at the Marx Brothers through two sets of eyes. There's the perspective we have now, informed by everything we know about the Marx Brothers and all the time we spend with them, and all we've been through with them. But then there's also those very powerful and lasting initial impressions, uh, the way we received these movies for the first time as kids. And for an awful lot of Marx Brothers fans, I think probably for the majority of Marx Brothers fans, Harpo was the part of the act that first, you know, spoke to us. Yeah. So was that the case with you, Bob? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's that way for pretty much anyone who got into the Marxes around the time I did, uh, you know, at age 10 or whatever. Um, Harpo was the candy which drew us in. Um, you know, Chico and Groucho looked funny and talked funny, but, you know, some of their stuff might have gone over our heads, but we got Harpo right away. We knew where he was coming from. He was us. He was he was the child. And, you know, he drew us in. And we understood everything he was about. And, uh, you know, he kept us he kept us intrigued until we, at least for me, until I fully learned to appreciate the, uh, Groucho and Chico. How about you, Matthew? Did Harpo get to your heart a little ahead of his brothers? Not as such. I mean, I, I, um, I, mean, I, I came to them. It, it, pretty much in the dark so um i wasn't i d- didn't really have any prior expectations and i'm i'm one of those people who never answers the question who is your favorite marx brother because uh, uh, you know it, to, to me they are kind of an in, an indivisible team and and so i i felt that i think from the from the first about him was that he was uh, just a you know a magnificent part of this team but certainly a huge part of why they were so wonderful the uh, you know a whole a whole layer of completely different different comedy from what from what the other the other members of the of the team were doing um and and obviously bewitching and enchanting yeah i think that's uh, more or less my answer too although I, I i do think you and i are outliers here i i think by the time i started watching the films i was already identifying so strongly with groucho and had kind of been told by adults you know ah oh, you, you know groucho marx you um, and so I, I was already, I guess Groucho was my guy before I encountered the films. Um, but it seems to be unusual. And lots of people uh, who I talk to about the Marx Brothers, even those who are now, uh, who now consider Groucho Marx their god, um, so often the story is that Harpo is what got their attention, uh, including lots of the prominent people who have written about the Marx Brothers. 
um, Harpo often seems to have been the way in. I certainly, when I was growing up, knew a lot of people who, who d- didn't much care for them per se, except for Harpo. That, that was quite a, quite a common thread. People who didn't really dig them, but they liked him. Absolutely. Do you like the Marx Brothers? Well, I loved Harpo. Mm. I, I think one, one thing about Harpo that is interesting, and, and maybe is a good way to, um, to open the larger conversation, is that on one hand, you can get him right away, like you say, Bob, a child, any, um, any kind of intellect, any kind of mentality can instantly appreciate what is wonderful about him. Um, and yet, um, he also is this endlessly opening Pandora's box. Um, I, I think in a way, by being so fixated on Groucho when I was first getting to know the films, um, I saved Harpo for later in some ways. And um, I, I've said this before on the podcast, but now when I watch the films, being very, very familiar with them, if I laugh out loud, it's almost always at Harpo. He's retained the ability to surprise me. Um, it, w- way beyond his brothers. Well, let me piggyback on something I had said earlier. Even though I was first drawn to Harpo when I first saw the team, as I started studying the films and you know recording them on audio cassettes and reading the script books and buying record albums and, and the Wyatt Duck book, once I did all that, I, I really got into you know the dialogue and Groucho and Chico a lot more. You know, Harpo couldn't come across well in those other mediums. You had to see the films to appreciate Harpo. You, you couldn't quote Harpo. It's a really good point that it is only in the films themselves that the measure of Harpo's greatness really comes across. I, and you could say that about the others too, but uh, to mm. a lesser degree. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it, maybe it would be uh, useful to make a distinction between the two Harpos. Uh, Harpo in his beautiful book, Harpo Speaks, uh, does that pretty close to the beginning of the book. He describes his stage and screen character uh, as another identity, another person, and talks about some of the similarities and differences that he has with that character. I thought Um, you meant two Harpos, meaning uh, Paramount and MGM. (laughs) <laughs> uh, well, we, we'll get into that, too, I'm, I'm quite sure. Uh, oh, and don't forget that RKO Harpo, the turkey hunter. <laughs> Harpo's uh, stage character, um, to start there, um, seems to me such a vivid um, comic archetype now. You can just close your eyes and spend time with him, and just the thought of him uh, makes you smile and laugh. Um, but like the other Marx Brothers characters, but more so, um, it's such an unlikely accident that this character even evolved. I, I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with the evolution of the character, so we don't have to go into it in great detail. But just to uh, just to put it out quickly, you know, he begins as part of the singing act. When it evolves into a comedy act, he takes the stock role of the Irish bumpkin and acquires the red wig and elements of the ratty costume. He proves more adept at uh, physical comedy than spoken comedy, so that by the time they're doing Home Again in the mid-teens, he's abandoned on stage speech altogether, never to return to it. Um, This character could only have emerged through the trial and error of all those years in front of live audiences. Um, And it Mm -hmm. seems a lot more acute. I mean, Groucho too, of course, was molded and shaped by the responses of audiences. I think Harpo's character was assigned to him by his audience uh, more decisively than Groucho's. Do you think so? That's a good point, actually. Yeah, I mean, you you can't imagine anybody sitting down and saying, right, I need to come up with a comic persona i know and coming up with that whereas with groucho and chico you could i mean you might not be able to do it particularly well uh, or certainly nowhere near as well as as they did and, and obviously it did uh take time to 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 really perfect but you could imagine coming up with a groucho type character or a chico type character but harpo it, um you know is un- unfathomable <laughs> And of course, he had many, many years to perfect this character in front of different audiences and different types of productions. So we're seeing the finished product. We, we catch him right at the right time when, when we first see him. Yes, indeed. Right at the moment of perfection. And also at a moment when Harpo was very much the star of the act. Um, I think that's one of the ways his character emerged the way it did. 
Um, we're so used to thinking of Groucho as the superstar of the Marx Brothers. But really, through at least I'll Say She Is and maybe even Coconuts on Broadway, Harpa was it was absolutely the star. Nobody seems to have been more aware of this than Groucho and Chico. And I think it allowed him to thrive on stage in a way that he, he only had to work for with the pleasure of a performer. It seems to me that the real man, Arthur Marx, if we want to call him that, um, yeah. he had this latent genius. But among his many wonderful qualities, one thing he didn't have is one of the things that we're always told you have to have in order to succeed, uh, particularly in show business, and that's ambition. Uh, he, he didn't have to be this ambitious go-getter. He didn't have to, I mean, not that he didn't work hard, not that he didn't suffer for his success, uh, but he was kind of swept up in the family business. He didn't have to um, knock on doors himself. He had endless opportunities to figure out how to do something on stage that would make an impact. Now, do you think that the fact that he wasn't so vested in success that it actually helped the development of the character. You know, he just threw caution to the wind and did what he felt was right. It seemed like he used that to his advantage. Absolutely. And the collective feeling of the team, the, the team was going to succeed or fail, um, but no individual member of it was going to succeed or fail without the others. And, and Harpo's disposition, the real man's disposition, uh, seems to have just lent itself well to being this experimental lab for comedy ideas. George Burns and many others have attested to Harpo's willingness to do anything for a laugh in, in real life. I mean, not even just on stage. Um, and some of the stories of the way he would accost strangers on the street to amuse the people he was with or to amuse no one in particular. They give me a, a sense of his courage and comfort. He must have been one of the most comfortable people who ever lived. Uh, we don't think of him as being embarrassed um, or seeing risks as having great consequences. I think it's equally hard, isn't it, to imagine what on earth would have become of him if they hadn't been in show business. You can, you can sort when you, you when you read Harpo speaks or the other accounts of them as as young men, you can sort of imagine where Groucho's road might go, and you could even imagine Chico getting some sort of a job involving numbers, you know, his, his facility with mathematics and so on. But Harpo just seems made to be a, a drifter, doesn't he? And obviously in the economic strata that they were born into, that wasn't going to be an option for him. So what on earth would have become of him? I, I, I can't begin to think. Yeah, I suppose he's the kind of person who really needed what we would now call a support network. Um, and whether it was show business or not, um, he would have needed the people around him to help him find a place. Um, it is true that his, whereas you say like Chico's practical ability with numbers or Groucho's practical ability with language uh, probably could have landed them in um, prosperous lives in other realms if things had been different. Uh, with Harpo, it's strange. Obviously, he was an inordinately talented man of many gifts. His intuitive musical ability maybe being the most, um, the most obvious and also the most commercially, you know, saleable. Uh, and yet, it's not so much proficiency um, as inspiration uh, that makes his performances great. Uh, my friend Seth Sheldon, who, who played Harpo in the revival of I'll Say She Is, and um, who has given me a lot of insight into Harpo, because he himself has so much to say about him. Uh, Seth has made a really interesting point that um, it's not that any of the specific things Harpo did uh, he did uh, you know, at a world-class level. Um, it's not that he was the most brilliant person in the world at sleight of hand or pantomime or you know, any of the things that he employed regularly. Uh, it's sort of the zeal with which he performed, um, the attitude and also just the, the ability to pick up 10 different instruments and make music with them. Um, it was his, it's, it sounds like a strange thing to say about Harpo of all people, but it, it was his intellect. It was his ideas that made him a genius. And his instincts as well. Uh, now, as this character developed, of course, one of the things that we were used to hearing in Marx Brothers literature um, is how difficult he was to write for. Um, but 
partly for that reason, he retained a level of autonomy in the later films that his brothers didn't. Uh, we've noticed in our deep dives that there are times in uh, the lesser films when Harpo alone sometimes still seems to be operating under his own rules. Um, performing sort of outside the jurisdiction um, of the studio. Uh, and I wonder if Harpo's decision not to speak gave him more license than other comedians had at the time. Yeah, as we all know, very often in the scripts, the writers just, you know, threw in the towel and said, you know, Harpo bit here and counted on Harpo or the director to come up with something on on the set. Uh, and actually, the the more freedom they gave Harpo to do comedy, the harder it was for the writers to make him a legitimate character. And this obviously became more of a problem at MGM because on stage in a Paramount, you know, they could do whatever they wanted with him and didn't have to worry about his motivations or, or his background. But once they needed to put him in sort of a real world or a real plot lines situation, it became harder and harder to... Um, to jump back and forth between the comedy which he was best suited for and that real world. And we talked about this uh, in our recent podcast about the alternate script for Go West. There were some real Paramount-type gags in there, but it was awkward because they would soon jump back into a real-world concern. And just the contrast of that uh, became very telling and very un un unusual. And it does allow him to to uh, to slip below the radar a bit there, you know, because obviously we know that when um, his gags are decided, you know, rigidly in advance, then he is as prone to being um, messed about with as anyone. You know, the famous example being the axe that he cuts the salami yeah. with, ha you know, has to has to be there. You know, he he can't just produce out of his coat anymore. But but you know, if 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 blanks are left for him, then that obviously does give him leeway to. Um, you know to, to work below the mgm ra radar it's like what um charles lawton said about um uh the haze code you know the, the, they can't censor the glint in my yeah. eye <laughs> um it, you know it's 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 a little like that you know that they, they can't they can't ruin jokes that 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 haven't even been written yet mm -hmm. The part of the way I think um, he developed his material in the act and, and also one of what seems to have been one of his uh, most prominent features as a human being uh, is that he seems to have been an unusually adaptable person. Um, that's a quality I really um, admire in people I know. Um, the ability to just be comfortable wherever you put them. Uh, Wilcott, in one of his appreciations of Harpo, says, you know, if you dropped him um, in, in, on a, a, a remote island somewhere, um, by the morning he'd have all these appointments. You know, he'd be meeting with the, the leader of the tribe and also with the, to go fishing with the peasants, you know. Um, absolutely comfortable. Um, which, which makes him... In addition to being, uh, in, in numerous ways, including this one, a, a polar opposite of Groucho, who never seems comfortable. Um. <laughs> yes, and 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 easily mixing with with all different types of people. You know, um, well, very wealthy people, aristocratic people, poor people that he grew up with, obviously intellectuals. You know, none of that would have been possible, I think, if he hadn't been so extraordinarily easygoing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and sort of egoless for a performer too, uh, and comes along, I suppose, with the level of courage and comfort and lack of ambition. Um, he seems to have been one of the most secure people who ever lived. On uh, Amazon and other booksellers right now, you know, if you look at um, speaking of Harpo, the upcoming Susan Marks memoir, uh, you know, you can read a little sample which is already available, uh, and that sample cuts off. Um, in the middle of a really interesting point. <laughs> Many of our listeners have probably experienced this themselves. Um, I just want to read these, um, what is it, uh, three and a half, four and a half sentences, <laughs> which is where our knowledge of this book cuts off right now. This is Susan talking about Harpo. She says, Harpo attracted offbeat people, but he himself was not offbeat. He was unusual in another way. He was abnormally sane. Harpo mm -hmm. was therapeutic. His dot dot dot, and we'll find out on July fifteenth what, yeah. <laughs> what where that sentence goes. Um, isn't that interesting? That's that uh, it resonates with much of what we've heard about Harpo from other sources. But um, she she puts that so beautifully. Um, we know mm -hmm. that about him, 
um, other than a willingness to act out and do crazy things for a laugh, um, this was a pretty normal guy. He didn't come across as a wild, zany. He might, if you were uh, uh, looking in on a lunch at the Algonquin, Harpo probably would have seemed like the least eccentric person um, yeah. sitting at that table. Uh, his book, too, he comes across that way. Um, uh, you know, he, he has this fabulous story, of course, and he is this unique figure. Um, but he tells his story in this very matter-of-fact way, like he could be recounting, um, you know, a, a life that doesn't seem on the surface as extraordinary to us as his does. Mm -hmm. And Susan's choice of the word therapeutic, too. Harpo was therapeutic, um, meaning that at what she seems to be saying there is that Harpo provided a therapeutic... Um, provided therapy or a therapeutic quality to the people around him. Spending time with him was healthy because he himself was so well adjusted. <laughs> and as you mentioned, a lot of this was already touched upon in, in Harpo Speaks, where, you know, it's brought up that he didn't undergo therapy and his marriage was fine and his kids were normal and there was just an exceptional lack of drama, especially when compared to uh, his brothers. I mean, it's almost like, huh? Well, none of which is is to say that he was uh, the more restrained when when they did cut loose. You know, I mean, right. there, there are lots and lots of stories about their, you know, their escapades, uh, sexual and otherwise, and you know, and he and he's always right in there with them. But he seemed to have this capacity to sort of know when when it was time both time in in the day and time in his life to to say okay i've i've, I've done all that and now i'm gonna step back yeah. and i'm gonna relax and uh, apparently the only two people on the planet he didn't like were uh adolf hitler and uh lester cowan and not necessarily <laughs> in that order yeah but <laughs> yes if only he had spit on hitler yeah <laughs> yeah i it, it seems, um, on one hand, that perhaps be because he was um, the least inhibited um, on stage, you know, the least inhibited of a pretty uninhibited bunch, uh, maybe that gave him a level of relaxation in his offstage life. Like, I'm addressing all my needs as far as uh, rebelliousness go in my work. So offstage, especially by the time he, he fell in love with Susan and settled down, you know, I think I'd like to be a dad and grow oranges and, and play yeah. golf and, and that'll do it for me. Um, but I also wonder if some of the differences in the personalities of the Marx brothers, uh, the differences among them, on one hand, it seems like an interesting series of exhibits in the argument about nature versus nurture. Um, on the other hand, when you're a team to that degree, not just close siblings, but close siblings who are living and working together every day for decades, um, maybe you just find that you develop the parts of your personality that are most needed, um, you know, in the collective of the team and the family. Um, Harpo was able to not take certain things seriously because it was being attended to by, yeah. you know, by Chico in some cases, Groucho in some cases. And he was able, um, by virtue of his family and circumstances, to just sort of f float through um, this remarkable life, um, essentially unscathed. Also, I think when when you seem to radiate goodness and kindness uh, the way he did, um, it has a profound effect on the people around you and the way you're treated and the way you perceive the world. Um, this is a line that I love uh, from the beginning part of Joe Adamson's book when he is introducing the brothers. Adamson says, A shine comes into the eyes of people who recall Harpo Marx that can scarcely be equaled by the one they reserve for their own mother. Yeah. <laughs> um, isn't that true? And Adamson's talking about having just, when he wrote that, interviewed a lot of people who were recalling Harpo, but it's even true for those of us who didn't know him um, and only know him as an artist. Uh, a shine comes into the eyes when recalling him. And it's been known for quite a while that Susan had started her memoirs. We just never thought we were ever going to see them. So I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, some some people we know have um, have seen early versions of Susan's book. I'm not. Sh I don't know the degree to which it has been prepared for a publication by Robert Bader, but I know some of our our close Harpo friends uh, who were privileged to who with whom Susan shared the the manuscript in progress. Um, one of the things that seems 
to be true about it, and it's even mentioned in the publicity copy for the, the publication of the book, uh, is that um, it includes her rather unbridled and um, perhaps at least substantially negative opinions uh, about Harpo's brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little uh, glimmer of that in her Marx Brothers scrapbook interview. Um, but I, I think we're going to get an unromanticized look at the Marx family in, in her book, um, among, I'm sure, many other things. Can't wait. Yeah. Um, well, um, it, it is also a book, it, it, by its very title, speaking of Harpo, it is um, positioned to interact, um, particularly with um, Harpo Speaks, also with Bill Marx's uh, really interesting book, Son of Harpo Speaks. Um, uh, so perhaps we'll talk about that a little bit for a moment. Um, it, it, we've, we've remarked in the past that, uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be assumed, um, that of the major Marx brothers, Harpo would be the one to write a truly great book. Um, uh, but Harpo Speaks is just that, and it is, um, not just one of the key uh, books in on the Marx Brothers bookshelf, but one of the key works in the Marx Brothers world uh, up there with the films. Um, what are your thoughts about the book? Well, obviously, we don't know how much of it he actually wrote. I mean, Rowan Barber very well could have done most of it. It might just be Harper had the best memory and had was the most willing to talk. It's true. The um, the literary uh, solidity of that book may be largely Roland Barber's work, mm -hmm. but surely Harpo's uh, memories and stories and, and mm -hmm. um, an attitude, a personality rises from those pages that is such a perfect match for the Harpo yeah. personality described yeah. to us. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, the people that did that did know him well uh, all, all seem to agree that that, that, that is his, his authentic tone of voice there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any uh, any opinions about Harpo Speaks? Obviously, we all love this book. Um, it's uh, but it's even more important than the other Marx Brothers books we love, isn't it? Well, with me, it's absolutely of a piece with with my my first discovery of of the films after the uh, the Christmas that I that I first saw them. Uh, this was the first book I got. I got it very very early in the, in the following New Year. Um, and and so it was absolutely part of that that first glow of magic. Uh, it, it's uh, it's indivisible from from that. And then over the next few years, I read the early chapters um, over and over again. I must confess that I always stopped when Walcott turned up. Um, I love that section now. I, I love it as much as any of it now. But at the time, it was it was. Up, up to uh, up to Walcott's arrival, that I just read over and over and over. Oh, when did you first read Harpo Speaks, Bob? I'm pretty sure it was in high school when I first saw it. Um, you know, it's a totally different experience reading it now because I, I took it all as gospel. I mean, this was a first-hand source, so I assumed everything in it was this was the final word on everything. And although many of the anecdotes aren't told anywhere else, many of the facts have been disproven or, you know, clarified elsewhere. So now rereading it again, I, I'm appreciating it more for the, you know, the person more than, than the facts. The, does that make any sense? Yeah. It's interesting how, um, although uh, famously Harpo, um, and he admits that uh, it's a jumble of places and, and names and dates, um, that it's not a book to be relied on um, necessarily for, uh, for facts and figures. Uh, but uh, much larger truths are, are in the book than than those kinds of truths. Uh, it does make me chuckle when Harpo says in the book, uh, in order to make sure that I have my facts right, I checked with Groucho and I checked with <laughs> Kyle Crichton. Or, or his... <laughs> yeah, it's obviously not a book anyone would go to in order to get you know a, a primer in 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 their um, their professional history or or any, anything else really. But it is, uh, you know, an invaluable uh, demonstration of of the person he was, and I think ne never more so than in the 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 often mentioned point that it it completely omits uh, Love Happy. It says that Night in Casablanca was that was their last film, and there's no mention of Love Happy at all. Now it's obvious why that's the case because it was such a such a disappointment for him, such a dispiriting experience. But still, you couldn't imagine anybody else really in his position not wanting to at least put the record straight, not yeah. wanting to to make the point that 
this film did go to production, that he was the star of it. Uh, and if you don't like it, it's not my fault. It's for these reasons. But he doesn't mm. do any of that because he doesn't want anything sour in the book at all. Which, in a way, tells us a lot about Harpo in itself. Yeah. It's interesting some of the stories he doesn't tell um, that we're so used to encountering in other sources. You know, he doesn't bother with uh, roasting potatoes naked in Thalberg's office. Um, he, do, You know, it, it's one of the things that gives the book authenticity um, is that we don't feel like he's checking boxes. Oh, I got to do that one. I got to do that one. It mm. really does feel like we've just been lucky enough to land uh, on a bar stool next to his and, and we're getting his story. One note about the book from a facts and figures point of view um, that always occurs to me now when I look at it, um, as Simon Luvish and Robert Bader have both pointed out in their books, uh, is that Harpo's timeline is very deliberately off. He, he makes himself five years younger um, than he really was. He states that he was born in 1893. Uh, even though if you just flip to the copyright page, it says the book is about Harpo Marx, 1888 <laughs> to 1964. Um, yeah, I mean, he was still working at the time uh, occasionally, and I'm guessing they'd sign contracts based on what they thought his age was. So not surprising. Oh, sure. And, and he's certainly not the only Hollywood figure to falsify his uh, birth date. Um, or, or, and it's, there's a rich heritage of doing that even just in the Marx family. Um, but uh, Simon Luvish in particular does a nice job of pointing out the implications of that timeline shift. Yeah. Um, for example, when Harpo joined the act and had his debut at Henderson's on Coney Island and, you know, soiled his trousers, as we all know. Um, well, we know that happened in 1908. So on Harpo's timeline in the book, that would make him 15 years old when that happened. Yeah. Uh, but he was 20. That's a very different thing. A 20-year-old yeah. pushed onto stage by his mother, petrified and um, losing control of his bodily functions is really different from a 15-year-old child doing that. Yeah. There are a few other strange things in there as well that are very, very hard to find um, documentary evidence for. I mean, there, there are things that seem to be deliberately confusing about mm. people, like this this uh, Fleming, the, the aviator. Matrix. Um, there's also a, a, a European tour he talks about that doesn't appear to have happened, um, and various other things that have been uprooted from from their actual uh, historical and, and geographical context and, and and plonked down elsewhere, seemingly yeah. um, deliberately, not 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 just uh, you know because he doesn't care about that stuff. Yeah, a part of the way the main body of the book is broken into these little vignettes, usually preceded by the name of a city they were playing, um, and then with an anecdote for what happened in that city. Uh, much of the, the center of the book is that, and um, by choosing that format, he really made it okay uh, for for he and Barber not to be too obsessed with um, with fact checking, it really does feel like fragments of memory. Um, and except for a sort of general chronology, it does feel like you could take those vignettes and throw them up in the air and, and do them in any order. Yeah. Um, that is, in a way, more true to how memory works um, uh, than to the way biographical research works. Now, what do we know about the genesis of this book? How did it come to be? Did he just decide the right one? Did someone come to him with money? Or what's the what's the deal? It is interesting, isn't it? In that they had all presumably contributed to the to the Carl Crichton book. Um, that you know that book is arranged in such a way that you can definitely tell. Oh, this is this is the section where he he spoke to Gummo. Mm -hmm. This is the section where he spoke to Chico, uh, and Harpo, and Groucho. And, and so, having done that, um, other other than Groucho, who who you know had literary aspirations his whole career, um, it, Harpo does seem like you know the, the least likely person to have then kind of picked up that ball again mm. um he certainly didn't need money particularly um he didn't crave the limelight as we know so it mm. is interesting that he that he felt he felt you know the, the the desire to do that because if he didn't feel the desire to do that he wouldn't have done under i think virtually any inducement um it did come out just a couple of years after groucho and me um it's possible that he felt um that Groucho's memoir um, demonstrated a desire for uh, books like this from the team. Um, it's hard to imagine Harpo feeling any sense of wanting to set 
the record straight yeah. or, or correct Groucho's memoir, but maybe it, it showed him the possibility. I wonder if too are we are we positive that he didn't need the money? Uh, um, the book was a, I guess we can call it the major project of his post film career. Um, he was of course doing lots of personal appearances with Chico and and singly, um, but a lot of his late TV appearances were in support of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he certainly promoted the hell out of it, didn't he? But um, I, I I always got the feeling that he he had invested wisely. Um, with the specific aim of of taking it easy in his in his later life and uh yeah he said once this book came out um he he certainly did um do a lot of work in promoting it had I, i'm going to reveal my ignorance here uh had chico already died when it came out no uh it came out no in uh 60 uh 61 well that is the year right ah yeah but harpo was promoting it on you bet your life and that was before chico died Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. isn't there a pic? Isn't there a picture of the the five of them um, at some sort of book party or event? Oh, um, where Harper's holding? holding the book. Yeah. 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 And I must say, if there's if there's ever been a better title for an autobiography, I have yet to hear it. Absolutely. That, yeah. and uh, I suppose that's why his son's book and his wife's book are are both playing on the title. I wonder if some publisher came up with the title first and said, "Oh." I, we got to do this. Harpo speaks. What a great idea! And then they went to him. Yeah. Well, uh, if we believe uh, certain legends, uh, that that phrase was uh, was uh, coined perhaps by a producer trying to get him to say one word in a night in Casablanca. <laughs> or, or is it a play on Garbo speaks? Maybe. Oh, that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, of course. Hmm. Um, I wonder if um, w whether the idea came from Harpo or somebody else, the initial inspiration, uh, let's do a memoir. Um, I wonder if there was a feeling that this was a voice that should be heard. Like this is a, um, a, a very famous, very beloved person who in a very real way people have never really met. Um, it's one of the things that makes it so different from Groucho's book. Uh, we read Groucho constantly comparing the voice on the page to the voice we know. Um, but Harpo's book is a voice we're hearing for the first time. Yeah, I mean, it's possible he might have just ha had to, had enough of, of all his friends saying, these stories are great, you know, you really should write a book. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I wonder if, um, although there is certainly not a trace of uh, spite or competition um, in, in the book, and, and seemingly there wasn't a trace of those things in Harpo himself, um, I wonder if he did feel like, uh, after all those years, he had a lot to say. Um, you know, it's not just that he didn't talk um, on stage or screen. He very rarely gave a substantive interview either. Um, in the early days, there's a few of them. Uh, he talks about um, uh, the etiquette of the theater in an in in interview from the 1920s that's interesting because it presents him as this dedicated follower of rules. Um, but as far as what was really on that man's mind, it's really Harpo Speaks that um, acquaints us with that. Mm -hmm. And he also, of course, presumably felt that he did have um a, a unique story of his own to tell which is obvious if you look at the book uh and compare the the, the proportions the page page numbers that he gives to to various things you know the 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 common bit the marx brothers bit is squeezed into a very short section and, and then it absolutely relaxes uh, and tells this story that is only his story which is the the meeting with walcott the friendship with walcott um and, and very much a tribute to walcott um and, and i and i I suspect that that was probably the thing that he most wanted to to get onto the record. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I also wonder if if um, if he had a sense of that uh, his family was going to um, outlive him considerably, um, that it was a way of leaving behind something of his real self. Um, he had a twenty year age difference with Susan, who lived for forty years after Harpo passed away, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and he had. A, kids who were fairly young at the time. Um, I wonder if um, he thought of the book in some ways as a last will and testament. Um, some of the stuff he, he says, particularly toward the end of the book about his very blissful and beautiful domestic life, it gives a sort of happy ending to the story of the hard scrabble career of the Marx Brothers. And um, not that there was much uh, uncertainty about this, but really shows you that Harpo was uh, a master of the art of being happy, 
Uh, mm-hmm. He figured it out. He kind of got to the finish line of that life, content, surrounded by love, a child in each window uh, as he got home from work. Mm-hmm. He sort of uh, won at life, as uh, we would say now on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any uh, any other thoughts about Harpo Speaks before we uh, move on? Yeah, I must read it someday. <laughs> I heavily, highly recommend it. <laughs> there should be an audio book of it. Uh, yeah, you know, I have had that thought too. Uh, just lately, uh, getting uh, reacquainted with the book in order to have this conversation. I did, I have had that thought. Oh, I wish I could just put it on while I'm, you know, cleaning and doing dishes and things. Well, uh, speaking of which, uh, um, apparently aren't there a... Uh, Recordings made of Harpo telling some of these stories that were used for reference and those may be coming out at some point. So I, I hear conflicting things about that. My understanding is that the, he only they only used recordings for, for a while, for, for the, the early sections, and then uh, mm. they abandoned that. So yes, they, they do all exist. They're in, they're in, uh, in the Harpo um, archives. But I, I believe it's, it's very, very far from the whole book yeah there is that excerpt part of the mrs shang boarding house story that has circulated um uh on the internet i'm not sure if it's currently on youtube but it was for a long time you can find it if you dig uh and it's very it whets your appetite because it does feel like a somewhat less polished but basically the same version of that story as told in the book and it kind of makes you feel like oh there must be 20 hours of Harpo just doing the book, but apparently not. And do we even know whether Harpo's family would even be behind such an effort? I've heard things about them not wanting his voice out there at all. That was always always the story, was that they were very annoyed that that clip had got out because the idea was that it, it spoils the, the magic. Um, without, without giving too much away, um, that attitude seems to have relaxed enormously to the point that um, there are some some very big surprises just around the corner. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder, and this is just my inference, but um, based on some of what we've heard about other things that feature a a talking Harpo that that could see the light of day at some point, um, I wonder if there is a distinction being made between Harpo speaking as a matter of public performance. Um, you know, we know that he, he narrated a version of Peter and the Wolf um, and that there are recordings of it uh, yeah. in existence. And uh, we all hope to, to hear that someday. Uh, but since he did it for public consumption, maybe the feeling is that was a Harpo authorized release of his voice. Yeah. And he spoke in uh, Too Many Kisses. Right, <laughs> and he probably spoke in humor risk as well. I was looking at a, um, some bits of Animal Crackers uh, earlier today, and um, you know, in the, the scene toward the end when the brothers all come out harmonizing on my old Kentucky home, mm. uh, I was just focusing in on Harpo and just watching him. It's really interesting to watch what he does there. He's he's behind the other three. His head is kind of peeking out over somebody's shoulder, mm. and he's making the same faces that one would make if one were singing. He's sort of communicating the song with his eyes and eyebrows. Um, and his lips are parted just enough so that you can believe for his own amusement, he may be vocalizing. Yeah, I get the feeling from watching that bit that he is he is singing and, and he's trying to sort of make it as, as, as unclear as possible. But he is contributing to that to that live recorded noise yeah uh if the harpo speaks audiobook of our dreams ever were to be produced um do you guys have any thoughts on how you would cast it uh computer generated jeffrey rush uh, should read <laughs> I don't, can, can seth do the voice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know he can do everything else <laughs> yeah both seth and les marsden both have a studied and convincing uh impression of Harpo speaking. Um, um, and uh, they've both uh, uh, done little readings for me for various things um, at an Anastasia's event uh, at the Lambs Club uh, in, in 2016. Seth read some of Harpo Speaks uh, as Harpo, um, and, and Les did a little bit of Harpo. In, and what are you going to do? Say it's not again. accurate? I mean, what are you going to, how are you going to criticize it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Bill Marks, um, who has, you know, been so generous with the world in sharing his mm. um, 
his impressions of his father, I mean, his vocal impression is what I'm getting to, but <laughs> his, his emotional impressions. Uh, so much of what we know and love about the real Harpo is thanks to how generous Bill has been sharing him with all of us. And in many of Bill's interviews and the audio book of Son of Harpo Speaks, which Bill reads and which is well worth uh, picking up and listening to, uh, Bill does a vocal impression of his father. Bill obviously knew that voice very well. And it's exactly as described, a low, rumbly, uh, Bill always says it about an octave lower than Groucho, uh, but the mm -hmm. same dialect. Um, Sometimes I imagine it's not quite, it's not exactly right, but sometimes when I think of Harpo talking, I think of Popeye, the way Popeye kind of <laughs> gruffly mumbles and in his good natured but also emotionally reactive way. A Jewish Popeye. A Jewish Popeye. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'd like to, uh, since we've just um, invoked some names uh, of people who have impersonated Harpo, um, one of the hardest things about doing that. Um, is capturing his musical ability, his musicianship, and particularly that on his signature instrument. There are so many things about Harpo that are remarkable and that uh, speak to us and that make us laugh. Um, it's easy sometimes to forget all about what, from some perspectives, is the main thing about him and certainly the source of his nickname. Uh, this guy, in addition to all this other stuff, he played the harp. And if you separate yourself from the familiarity of that fact, yeah. um, it's it's not hard to be reminded of how bizarre it is, what a strange and wonderful choice it was. Now, if someone was watching one of their films for the first time and never heard of the brothers, didn't know their names or anything, was watching for 45 minutes, and you asked them, what's the last thing in the world you expect this guy with the curly hair to do? The answer would probably be, play the harp because it really does come out of nowhere and it totally totally doesn't make any sense which in its own way fits the character exactly him doing things that don't make sense and that come out of nowhere and surprise you i mean that's what he's about so it does fit exactly i mean you could imagine you know some some agent or you know some some idiot wanting to throw his opinions about uh, saying you know no no you, you you can't play that you got to play a funny instrument you got to be you got to be you got to have a crazy act you know like chico he, he when he plays the piano it's funny you got to be mm -hmm. funny um but of course but of course it, it's it's that very transition from 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 anarchist to a to angel um mm -hmm. in which so much of his of his magic resides yeah yeah, the word angel comes up uh, a lot when talking about Harpo and the harp, and it certainly does that. It gives him an angelic quality. Um, it The harp is such a um, delicate and serious instrument, and I also think these qualities are, are exaggerated now because the harp is a pretty unusual instrument now it, it doesn't have a lot of it doesn't have currency in, in popular music now for example um, it, it's it's not even necessarily considered um, an essential part of a symphony orchestra now although it does often appear there um, but at the time harpo took up the harp um, it was a much more popular instrument um, it, it wasn't outrageous to think that you might see a harpist uh, on a vaudeville bill um, although they wouldn't be anything like harpo um, we know that Harpo himself sort of inherited not the physical harp, but perhaps the interest in the harp from Grandma Fanny, uh, Minnie's mother, who had played the harp in her act with uh, her husband Leif in Germany. And that Fanny's harp, although in a decrepit and unplayable state, was in the household on East 93rd Street and, and meant something to Harpo growing up. After the vaudeville career begins, um, as Harpo explains in his book, Minnie just sends him a harp and says, here you go, uh, play this in the act. Uh, I, I put down $10, you're going to pay a, a, a dollar uh, a dollar a month to pay off the remaining $35 cost of, <laughs> of that first harp. Um, you can see why Minnie probably thought it was a good idea, not only because it reminded her of her mother, but because it brought something to the act that Minnie always felt the act really needed, which was class. Mm -hmm. um, it does that. It, I, we can say that it has a different aesthetic quality than anything else in the act. Um, I think it resonates with me more for its different emotional quality. It's really the only, in, in the best of the Marx Brothers work, the harp solos seem to me the only the only down notes in their work, the only 
real passages of sentiment. And it is, I think, I think it it, it is a part of of that character. I mean, Harpo in the books very explicitly says, you know, when when he's when he's running about causing chaos, it's him. When he sits down to play play the harp, it's me. Um, but uh, no, I think I think the guy that plays the harp is him too. I think it's just another unexpected magical side of that same character. Yeah, I I um, I, de- I developed an appreciation for the harp solos uh, a, a little behind my appreciation of the other elements in the films, including Chekhov's piano solos, which are more willfully entertaining. Um, the harp solos have a meditative quality to them, although of course they are entertaining and and touching. It almost feels like we're being permitted to look in on a private moment that Harpo is having. Now, we had spoken earlier about what Harpo might have done with his life had he not pursued a a career with his brothers on stage. I'm wondering whether the fact that he had a passion for the harp uh, could be a hint as to what he might have done. Could he have pursued a career along those lines? Was there such thing as a professional harp player? Uh, I don't know. That's an interesting point, isn't it? Because he started playing the harp... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, substantially before he was finally corralled into, into Mm. joining the act. Is that, is Mm. that true? So, so he wasn't, I don't think so. No. I, I think he was already in the act. Um, and when Minnie, uh, sent him that harp, um, and I think it was specifically to give him something to do in the act, something musical to do as well. Yeah. But it was something he was going to do the rest of his life, whether he, remain the performer or not i mean obviously he it was something that he that he always kept up um he always did his 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 bit of practice every day and it was obviously something that brought him enormous enormous pleasure and enormous sort of uh comfort you know emotional um peace serenity but it yeah i mean what i still can't see him thinking Plus, I can make a really great career out of this. You know, I, right, I still right, see him right. in his in his, in his room, just just you know, blissing out. Yeah, I I think he was certainly passionate about music and about the harp, although not ambitious in the career sense. But I do think that was um, what he loved. You know, uh, perhaps more than anything other than his family, um, and that love comes across in his in his playing and uh, also in his writing about it. In the book. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is obviously a very important part of who he is. And anybody who, if you play a musical instrument at all, uh, uh, whether you play it well or not, there is some. It does. It does open your consciousness in ways that nothing else does, and it it brings uh, it brings joy and peace. I think Harper was particularly uh, in touch with that. It is also true that before he joined the act, what uh, stumblings he had career-wise, uh, music was easily the, the most promising of those, you know. I mean, he was a bellboy and, and had jobs like that, um, but it was, you know, playing the piano in, in silent movie houses and in brothels. Uh, of his pre-vaudeville work, that was probably the thing that he might have conceivably developed into a career. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Harpo and the Harp, although we have touched on this recently, a couple of episodes ago, uh, there is the matter of Harpo having some assistance with the Harp solos in the films, uh, particularly we know uh, the MGM films. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, people uh, don't like this subject when it comes up. They feel that it's taking something away from Harpo. So why are you bringing it up? I, I think... <laughs> the. <laughs> I think the problem is that people automatically think that if if um, we say that that he you know received help doing this, that that automatically means because he couldn't do it himself, and it, and it doesn't automatically mean that any more than um, you know as we know any suggestion that some of Groucho's uh, literary uh, essays were not written by him, um, the 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 indignant. Um, reaction is always you know there, there's no reason to think groucho couldn't have done that and and no i'm i'm not saying he couldn't i'm saying he didn't and that's very very different sometimes it's just a matter of 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 
how many hours there are in the day and there's also it's also a matter of of what your personal priorities are and we now think of those 13 films as their legacy i doubt any of them did particularly in pre home media days where apart from the occasional reissue uh you know a film was was here and then it went like like yesterday's newspaper and i think if if he was miming to a playback um you know why why would that bother him particularly if, if it was if he wasn't able to come in for the recording if he didn't fancy coming in for the recording you know his job in the film is just to to yeah. physically visually visually do it obviously he wouldn't go out onto a, a concert stage and and mime um but films you know eh, why not yes he demonstrated on stage for decades that he could get up m multiple times a day and play a brilliant harp solo. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's just it's just silly to interpret the uh, assisted solos in the later yeah. films as as evidence that he couldn't play or, or wasn't really as good as as it seems or something like that. And he released like several albums of his own harp playing. Indeed, there's a whole body of work in his later career that is a largely collaboration between Harpo and his son, Bill. Um, those albums are beautiful, and, and um, as many know, Bill came up with a special uh, form of musical notation so that he could compose for Harpo, and um, who was who was uh, musically illiterate but mm -hmm. uh, intuitively ingenious. Mm -hmm. I think if you're if you're gonna care about how the films were made and the lives of the people behind them and the backstage and behind the scenes stories, um, then you have to accept that there is a large degree of artifice in all show business. Yeah. Um, you can also choose not to touch that stuff, just engage with the films themselves as an audience member and maintain every illusion. Um, and if that's the way you choose to enjoy the Marx Brothers, you know, more power to you. Uh, but as soon as you grant yourself a glimpse behind the curtain, yeah. uh, it's that's just the way these things go. So much of what we see uh, is is contrived in that way. Yeah. And folks, I got an even bigger shock for you. Despite what you saw on the screen, he couldn't uh, roller skate or fly a plane that well either. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing that uh, our listeners know they can always count on us for is um, against the grain opinions, uh, unlikely theories, uh, thinly supported uh, hypotheses, <laughs> <laughs> um, and impertinent questions. Um, and um, I know that we all have uh, some uh, observations as well as questions about Harpo uh, that are off the beaten path. Um, anybody want to kick this off? Okay, I'll dive in first. Um, here we go. At Paramount, even though Harpo didn't get the most laughs, he certainly got the biggest. But once they got to MGM, that really wasn't the case anymore. That's it. I completely agree. Often in Paramount, he's the, he's the topper, isn't he? Yeah. He, he, he comes in at, at the end and... and hammers hammers the, the last nail in whereas at mgm he, he 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 drifts through more yeah i think two things are true at the same time one thing is as suggested earlier in the mgm films when there are moments that feel like paramount it, they are most likely harpo's moments mm -hmm. for reasons given earlier however the way things were run at mgm um groucho I think, assumed the center spotlight more decisively than he had before, specifically because the new formula gave Groucho more room yeah. to play. Yeah, I, the way I see it, at Paramount, these huge laughs that he got, he was doing unexpected things. The, the, the last thing in the world you would expect, like, what? Why, why is he doing that? That would be the basis for his humor. But at MGM, he was just doing normal or expected things, but in a funny way. And it's a fine line, but there is a difference, you know. Mm -hmm. At MGM, he ate a meal in a funny way. At Paramount, he ate a telephone. There's a difference there. He's more of a stock clown, I think. Um, and and that point that that, that Noah often makes um, that he, he he really isn't a silent comedian as such somebody who who could be uprooted into into the world of silent comedy um the mgm harpo 
you get more of a feeling of that that he that he's a, a silent comedian that he's doing visual jokes and so on um the the very unusualness of his paramount persona is 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 blunted although he's still funny often yes absolutely true uh, and some of this i think is connected to the point about um about harpo having been the star of the act uh, pretty much up until the beginning of the 1930s when, when Groucho really does uh, become that. Um, I, I think uh, there are many reasons for this, um, but I think one of them may just be that Harpo in the 1920s, uh, he just really was, as an artist, right in the sweet spot of the zeitgeist, the whimsy and fun of the 1920s, uh, the wonderful nonsense. Um, Harpo was just engineered to be a, a comic icon of those times. Um, and I think that may be why the audience responded to him uh, even more resoundingly, um, because Harpo was unique among non-speaking artists in a way that even Groucho wasn't among wisecracking comedians or Chico among dialect mm -hmm. comedians. Um, and then um, in the 1930s, um, we the the shift from stage to film is what we always um, uh, uh, notice the most. Um, but it's also a shift, a, a global shift from prosperity to very bleak times. And I think um, against the sort of brittle and gloomy backdrop of the Depression, uh, Groucho found himself in the position Harpo had been in in the 20s. Now Groucho's attitude was more the way people were feeling. Um, Groucho was uh, the correct comic voice for the 1930s um, in a way that maybe he hadn't quite been in the 20s. Mm -hmm. um, you had asked an interesting question uh, during some of our preparation, Bob, about um, whether Harpo could have made it as a solo. Um, if you imagine a show business career more or less like the one he had, um, but not as part of a team, not with his brothers, um, it's obviously, uh, it, it gets impossible if you right. get too deep into the history. But as a theoretical question, uh, what do you think about that? What struck me, um, thinking about Harpo as a, as a solo, um, is that if love happy hadn't exist didn't exist i think we would find it very very hard to imagine what a solo harpo vehicle might be like i mean groucho as a, as a solo film star i think we could imagine even if those films didn't exist it, it, it's it's fairly straightforward harpo i think it it would be very very hard and but it, we do have this this artifact called love happy which i think most people kind of broadly think of as a, as a sort of a, a sweet failure, um, a, a film that has a certain degree of charm and nice things in it, but, but which which ultimately doesn't work. I mean, obviously, Chico and Groucho are in it as well, but it's very easy to imagine taking them out, uh, Chico mm. taken out completely and Groucho recast with someone else. And then you would have a Harpo film. And, and the kind of excuse that we're given is that Lester Cowan ruined his his vision uh the spoil you know spoiled the film uh but my kind of hot take is i don't think if it was done exactly the way harpo and ben hecht envisaged it it really would have been much better and that and the point i'm getting around to is that i i don't really think he can sustain a vehicle all on his own uh and that love happy irrespective of, of what Cowan has done to it, shows us that. Yeah. It seems as though the Harpo of Love Happy is just an extension or a natural evolution of the MGM Harpo, you know, with the depth and the feeling and blah, 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 blah. Now, let's say you wanted to take the Harpo of Horse Feathers and build a film around him. Now, how would you do that? I mean, what's the character? How would you build a film around that? It would have to be a short, wouldn't it? It, it could... It could not be more than 20 minutes, I don't think. Because there's no way he could have any type of... Meaningful interaction, yeah. Right. It would need to be a film like a, like an animated cartoon. You know, he could he could have he could have, as it were, you know, worked for for the for Max Fleischer or for um, uh, Tex Avery. You know, he would have he would have fitted into that kind of thing. But you right. you can't do that in 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 live action. Right. Yes, because he played a character who had unlimited agency but no mm. purpose. 
right? Mm. Um, which is hard to write for, even if he can talk, isn't it? And 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 I think um, I, I would give a qualified yes to the question of whether he would work as a solo, uh, because although I can imagine it, it's more imagining him as part of a different team. Um, if you, he, I think that character might work in something that Groucho and Chico weren't in, uh, but he would still have to be in a story where other characters are providing the engine for the plot and for yeah. events, or even if, even if the plot's not important, the engine for the premise of an individual comedy scene. He would have to have, as Love Happy sort of attempts to do, he would have to have both allies and opponents. He needs people to talk to. Uh, my, my against the grain uh, opinion about him, uh, which I won't go into detail about because I have before and Matthew has very uh, uh, adeptly summed it up just a moment ago, uh, is the idea that he's not really a mime or a clown, although it makes perfect sense to reach for those words when trying to talk about a non-speaking comedian, um, you know, um, it, it's not hard to see what the, the big differences are between Harpo and, and artists who are more properly described as as mimes and clowns um but the fact that he uh the fact that he wasn't any of those things um doesn't necessarily tell us uh what he was which i feel strongly is a verbal comedian a non-speaking verbal comedian whose jokes are still mostly about language um Mm -hmm. although you can find isolated exceptions throughout the films generally speaking harpo needs somebody to say something to him, uh, to make a demand of him, to ask him a question, or to try to interact with him the way you would interact with a normal person, uh, for him to flourish. And, um, you know, uh, the example I always give is this swordfish uh, gag and horse feathers, you know, when he has to give the password. Uh, you can imagine how a mime would handle that, pantomiming s- right. a sword and a fish. Uh, yeah. Not Harpo, he has a sword and a fish. <laughs> Yeah, all that being said, Harpo could have worked in a two-man team. Uh, we've seen him with Chico. I certainly think that would have been a, uh, a pairing that could have worked, at least in shorts. Maybe just with a straight man crooner, you know, like a Dean Martin or something like that. Just somebody with a foot in the real world to keep the plot going, to react to Harpo or for Harpo to react to. That's fine. Maybe even Zeppo. <laughs> Anybody. Just somebody. You needed one other person in there. Uh to, to be in Harpo, at least partially in Harpo's world. You know, it might have been interesting, uh, I'm just pulling this out of out of nothing, but um, I- imagine a, a buddy film uh, with starring Harpo and Uncle Al Sheen. <laughs> uh, we've always wondered uh, what the story is, why the Marx Brothers never got together publicly with Uncle Al, um, who... who you know, was in Hollywood all through their their film years and was making movies. And uh, um, uh, what about that? What if Harpo and Uncle Al had made like a road picture together? Uh, <laughs> um, I can kind of see it. Uncle Al's uh, at least the character that comes across from from what footage we have on him mm-hmm. uh, is is a kind of uh, yeah. impish. Um, Eastern European uh, scrappy guy. Uh, you can imagine him taking control of situations the way Groucho would. Yeah. Um, you can also imagine him having a kind of brotherly um, exchange with Harpo the way Chico did. Uh, maybe Uncle Al could have been Harpo's mm. brothers. <laughs> it's interesting that while Harpo and Chico seem like a, a natural team that could have been viable, Harpo and Groucho doesn't quite feel like it has that same vibe. I'm not sure they could have been... Uh, a good team together. Uh, they had moments here and there where they interacted, uh, the, the mirror scene and s- some gags here and there where Groucho is reacting to Harpo. But I don't know if they had much chemistry. Uh, even the opening of the big store, which is not bad, but whatever humor is in it is because of what they're doing individually. It's not like they have some great vibe going between them. It's not who's on first. So I'm not sure they would have been a, a good team. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I mean, their their great passage together is is the mirror scene in Duck Soup, right. which is, as we've noted before, nothing like anything else in in the Marx Brothers' work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I think um, uh, Harpo and Groucho are, in a certain sense, too similar to play off each other. Um, 
You know, uh, there have been a couple of occasions when uh, Seth and I have done an event together yeah. uh, in, in character uh, where we don't have a Chico mm -hmm. um, and we have to figure out stuff we can do in front of an audience as, mm -hmm. as Harpo and Groucho. And it's, it's really hard to make that work. And what we've done on those occasions is what you wind up doing is just making Groucho generic. Right. Um, either give Groucho some Chico-like stuff to, to do with Harpo in either a pantomime piece or a uh, get the fish, the flash, the flush, the flutes. You know, you can do that as Groucho, even though it's not quite right. Um, and the other thing we have done together is do the silverware dropping routine. Right. Um, but it requires Groucho to suddenly become the officious Right. voice of of law and order and yeah. it, it it works only so far so yes i don't i don't think they work together you know i'm wondering whether it might have been fun to have groucho trying to interpret one of harpo's uh charade messages instead of going back to chico for the same gags again and again uh, might have been a nice change of pace yeah there has to be a reason why that big store scene is so rare. I mean, I, I doubt very much that they ever sat down and, and talked about it, uh, you know, thrashed it out and said, mm, that, that, you know, that pairing works and that pairing doesn't. It all feels very, very instinctive and, and just yeah. points to, a, to an instinctive understanding of, of where they, you know, where they legitimately pair off. Yeah, one reason I do wish that they had found more occasion to get Groucho and Harpo together and find material for them as a as a two man act within the act, uh, is because whenever um, they, there is a moment of, of reaction between them, um, as uh, as others have noted, you can see uh, on Groucho's face how much he loves mm -hmm. Harpo. Uh, you can see he is delighted with Harpo. Uh, and it's it's rare to catch Groucho in, in any kind of moment of what seems to be sincere emotion. Mm. Um, and for it to be something so sweet, uh, it just makes it doubly touching. Um, there's a sentence in Adamson that I think I'm getting verbatim here where he says, uh, Groucho, who's, uh, who's um, this is paraphrasing. Let's say it's a paraphrase. He says that Groucho, who, whose face uh, reveals absolute delight with everything his brother is doing, is given a lot of lines about how annoyed he is. Um, I, I think it's the uh, breakfast scene in A Night at the Opera. Yeah. Um, yes, that lovely moment where where Harpo is using a, a, a rubber glove as an udder to uh, to produce yeah. a, in, invisible milk, uh, and Groucho immediately says, "Oh, I'll I'll take some of that," and holds his cup out in a way that you know, a, in a way that Chico's absurdity, you know, he he would never uh, you know um, tolerate. That's right. Yeah, it's a contrast to his attitude toward Chico, which is you know always you know yeah get away from that tree before it dies. <laughs> uh, but Harpo makes the tree grow stronger. Yeah, I, I wanted to say something about his attitude towards sentimentality. Um, the idea that, that his character can be used for, for pathos. I mean, obviously, we, we, we tend to look at the moments in Day at the Races and, and Night at the Opera and say, oh, oh that's Thalberg. But I, mm. I, I think it is something that he himself also was, was very keen to, to add to that character's repertoire. It seems to us now, I think... Uh, a, a, as a mistake, uh, as not something he should be doing, um, but but nobody understood that character better than than he did. Uh, you know, Groucho I think says about Love Happy. Oh, Harper wanted to be Chaplin. It, it, it is interesting, isn't it, that he didn't see that move towards being a pathetic, sentimental character as something that fundamentally undermined his strengths. There were a few moments in the Paramount films where he he is showing sympathy for other characters you know with the lollipop and all that but it's when yeah. somebody's showing sympathy for him that maybe it's that it doesn't mm. feel right or if there's just too much of it i mean that bit with the lollipop is right. lovely because it comes from nowhere and then it fades mm. you know but when he when he's spending you know loads of time mooning over some girl or, or trying to help help out some mm. some couple you know right. and yet it you know it does seem to be something that that wasn't an imposition for him mm. some of the moments of uh, glimmers of pathos and sentiment in in Harpo's performances in the Paramount films. I think, unless I'm not, there's things I'm not thinking of. Uh, I think that they're mostly in coconuts and animal crackers, which is revealing. You know, they they're the the vehicles that he did on stage um, when uh, there was a something of a mandate to ingratiate yourself to the giant audience that's sitting right in front of you. In this time when Harpo was. Um, 
you know, getting uh, inculcated into the world of the Algonquin Round Table and was getting the attention of all these uh, very brainy people, um, I think a lot of there was a lot of pressure on him from that crowd to establish himself as a maybe a, a more um, consciously artful kind of performer. Um, I think uh, the, the New York Times review of either I'll Say She Is or Coconuts uh, specifically says, you know, uh, that that uh, Harpo is delightful, but there's more to him. There's pathos in him, and uh, mm. that should be explored, you know. Um, uh, Wolcott was was big on comparing Harpo to Chaplin and championing the, championing the Russian uh, adventure uh, on that basis. Um, so it may be that uh, Harpo was influenced by his friends a little bit in, in devising those kinds of moments or in, in playing them with a certain sweetness. Mm -hmm. I also think that uh, he saves himself a lot from being too cute um, by not talking. Uh, if Harpo were talking, I don't think we could tolerate uh, how adorable he is. Um, <laughs> but because he isn't, um, you just want to squeeze him. <laughs> Is that right? Like, if I shut up right now, don't you think I'd be a lot more charming? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there are many aspects of the Marx Brothers Act that um, we are often asked or moved to discuss, well, whether they could be done today, uh, how they would interact with um, social mores in, uh, in 2022. Um, Harpo carries some of that burden um, because one of the things that, that may stand out as very strange and and perhaps even off-putting about the act to contemporary audiences is Harpo's girl chasing, mm -hmm. um, which was such a standard part of what he did and was presented as the most innocent thing in the world. Um, hey, we've all encountered these people on the internet. They are not buying any explanation about, oh, Harpo wouldn't know what to do with a girl if he caught one. And look at the end of Animal Crackers. It's so sweet. Uh, that's not going to fly. You know, and all you have to do is show them duck soup and the lemonade vendor's wife and how, how Harpo's got her cornered. Uh, <laughs> there is really going to be no justification for that. I think it's slightly different from certain other things in, in their films that, that would seem to fall into the same category mm -hmm. in that I think it, if, if it does reflect a change, it reflects a change more about comedy itself rather than society i mean things yeah. like you know the, the 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 very very small amount of of racially sensitive material mm -hmm. um that's not that's just you know that is a reflection of its times that we've that we've moved on from something yeah. that seemed very very normal then and doesn't seem very very normal now um mm -hmm. but obviously you know Har harpo <laughs> in reality would be no more free to to chase women about then any more than he than he would be now it's something Something that is still, you know, socially obnoxious to do. Uh, the the only thing that might have become more sensitive is our is our willingness to laugh at it per se. Exactly, exactly. And a, a, a modern example of that is, I saw an interview with Steve Carell about the Office, the American version of the Office, and he was saying that even though it was only like fifteen years ago, they couldn't do today. Uh, a lot of the humor that was done then because things that were considered funny and uh, and humorous in 2005 wouldn't be acceptable to uh, a 2022 audience. So things change yeah. and they change quickly. It's undoubtedly true. I mean, and that's sort of always been true. And I'm always, although I understand what people are responding to and it's undeniable that sometimes the corrections we make yeah socially can be over corrections and we can all see when these things get ridiculous. But um, I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody really object or make a serious point or, or, or say that they were disturbed or, or put off by Harpo chasing girls. It's more like you see it and you think, Oh, people are going to have a problem with that. Mm. Um, now, I don't want to be so presumptuous as to say nobody has a problem with it. It doesn't bother anybody. It's a non-issue because uh, I'm sure there may be people for whom it, it genuinely is. Um, but uh, to me, it, it, in the films, it seems, uh, um, it seems, uh, uh, 
not only acceptable, but of a piece with everything yeah. else. The, the thing that opens up how tricky it is, in my experience, is when you try to recreate this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, working on the I'll Say She Is project, we would constantly find times when that's what Harper would do. Oh, he would chase a girl, you know, he would run across the stage chasing a girl, or yeah. he would launch into some kind of, for lack of a better word, attack on this chorus girl. Um, right. But then when you're in you're not watching a Marx Brothers movie that was made in the 30s. You're in a rehearsal room with real people and <laughs> yeah. you're considering every moment of this. Yeah. You think, oh, God, can, can we do this? I mean, is this going to be okay? Or is this just, is it gross in some way? Speaking of which, I, I seem to remember um, being very interested, Noah, um, that, that you did a, a, a personal appearance as Groucho. Uh, and I think you had Seth chasing Amanda saying, I only came for the art. Is that? That's right. That, yes, yeah. I, and I've and I've, I've meant to ask you: um, Did you get any any kind of adverse reaction to that afterwards? No, uh, although that that event was one where I wouldn't have expected it um, because it was um, an, an audience of fans, you know. Right. Um, I think that was an event in 2015. I did an event at the Jewish Museum um, where there. Um, uh, one of their directors um, interviewed me on stage for an hour as Groucho. It was an unscripted hour of conversation as Groucho. And we had Seth come to that event in character and make a couple of surprise appearances, right. um, which, which was wonderful. That was one of the events, uh, as mentioned earlier, where we had to figure out some way to get uh, Harpo and Groucho to interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, Amanda, my wife, and also a, a performer and, and uh, director of the 2016 I'll Say She Is, uh, she was there and we thought, oh, well, we'll use Amanda as uh, as a cast member here for, for Seth to chase. Um, and that's how we'll reveal Harpo, which happened uh, a lot in his career. You'd be alerted to his presence by the sound of a female scream. Mm. Um, and Amanda ran up on the stage where I was sitting um, in, t in two chairs with the, the director. And uh, she ran up on stage. Since it was at a museum, that's why she said, I just came here for the art. And Seth ran up on stage and chased her off. You know, it, it got a great response from the audience. Um, and as I think part of the reason Harpo was so fond of doing that unexpectedly is because it just... You know, it does just kind of jazz up a room. Uh, you've been listening to talk, and suddenly there's there's running and screaming and uh, uh, unbridled manic energy. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't a time when it felt like a, a, a faux pas. But in I'll Say She Is, we did make judicious choices about when and in what way Harpo should chase girls. Yeah, for, from my experience, I don't, I haven't come across many people who who have a you know just a blanket. Um, um, dislike of it per se so much as, as as two specific examples one of which as as bob said is is the scene with the lemonade seller's wife in duck soup i think because his movements are slow um he's sort of advancing towards us slowly which has which carries a, a rather different connotation the other one which i think is much more defensible and, and i really can't see how anybody could have a problem with it is him punching margaret dumont and, and uh, <laughs> rising up into the air uh, she can't take it there oh she had a comment she had a comment. <laughs> but a lot of people do do cite that as, as as going too far i mean i certainly wouldn't try to talk someone out of feeling that that was going too far <laughs> um, obviously it is um, but going too far was the joke yeah and yet um i i guess all i can say is that it doesn't bother me um I, but 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 full full credit and deference to anyone who who is bothered by it. There's probably no moment in the history of cinema which causes more confusion to an audience. They don't know whether to laugh or to be shocked. They they might want to laugh but feel it's inappropriate to laugh. I mean, I remember feeling that way when I first saw the film back in the 1970s. <laughs> Oh well, I, one interesting exercise is if you imagine that uh, that punching Margaret Dumont at the bridge game moment. Um, imagine how that would play if any of the other brothers were to do it. <laughs> and I don't think, uh, even in 1930, I don't I don't think that would be okay. Well, I think Zeppo did do it in real life, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I thought uh, maybe it would be fun to do a little lightning round uh, among the three of us uh, with some of our, our picks for our favorite uh, signature Harpo moments. Um, and we'll start with uh, one area in which I feel he was often not well served. Uh, that's the challenge of coming up with a name for this character. Uh, Harpo's character names are... Uh, are a, a distinct set of problems. Uh, what are your favorite and least favorite things he was called in the movies? I only really like one. Um, I, I I don't I don't think he should have a funny name. Uh, mm. You know, stuffy or fluffy or tittles or whatever you know whatever you <laughs> want to call him. Um, I, I think he should have no name. I think we should not know what his name is, and therefore um, I don't like any of them except the one absolutely perfect unimprovable one which is the professor yep totally agree it, it adds an air of mystery that is absolutely perfect absolutely yeah I, and actually even though we may know the nicknames pinky or rusty or whatever we never know the character's actual given name for all we know it might be uh bernie goldstein <laughs> or something like that uh, you know uh, and the fact that he's you know often portrayed as Chico's brother or comes from wherever Chico came from that he very well could be Italian in background and the only mm. time that's ever addressed is in a night at the opera is Tommaso which might be my second favorite yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Tommaso uh, it, 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 there's nothing special about it but it's it's a name I, I'd rather think of him as Tommaso, uh, Tommaso than you know stuffy yeah. and punchy and mm. uh, the only virtue of those names for him stuffy punchy pinky uh, wacky is um, sometimes it's fun when Chico addresses him by those names. It feels like an affectionate brotherly nickname yeah. that, that Chico has for him. Um, that I can accept, but the idea that it is his name never quite works, um, or never quite works for me. Uh, the idea that his name, uh, what, what, did you, what was the name you just gave him? Uh, Bernie Goldstein? Brillstein or something? Yeah. <laughs> Bernie Goldstein. Uh, it reminds me of the uh, You Bet Your Life episode where Harpo makes a surprise appearance and he is introduced by uh, Fenneman as Mr. Charles Kephart. Yeah. <laughs> <And> the idea... <laughs> <laughs> the idea that, the, which I think was the name of the actual contestant who Harpo was momentarily uh, replacing there. Um, but the idea that uh, that figure could be introduced with a name like Mr. Charles Kephart is, uh, is richly amusing to me. How do you feel about uh, the character being called Harpo? I mean, technically, that's what he is in Coconuts and Love Happy, right? Yeah. I think if he wasn't known as that generally, if he if we if he was known as Arthur Marks, to call the character mm -hmm. Harpo, I think would sound as bad as wacky. His character names are the closest to his stage name, mm -hmm. um, you know, compared to Groucho and Chico and, and Zeppo. I don't know. In in um, in Love Happy, he's actually addressed as Harpo. I mean, the name Harpo is spoken out loud in the movie, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little different. Coconuts, he's identified that way in the credits, but I don't think anyone ever calls him Harpo. And I think in the stage Coconuts, he was Silent Sam. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Um, well, wh uh, what about the harp solos? Um, what are your favorite uh, harp solos? And um, or if you have least favorites or or negative notes about those uh what are those i wouldn't say i have one that's head and shoulders above the others but i guess i would choose everyone says i love you uh from horse feathers i just find it charming i like the way it's staged and directed and i love the tune and i don't know i just i love everything about it uh i'll tell you what i wouldn't pick is the one that everybody seems partial to the uh big number from the big store with all the mirrors and everything, that, that really doesn't do anything for me. I mean, I don't hate it, but I don't see what the big deal is. Eh. Uh, I basically like them all, but I prefer the ones where he, he goes off into a quiet corner and, and, and does it for us rather than ones where he does it where there are lots of people milling about. Um, I like his um, Why Am I So Romantic very much because it's so dreamy. Um mm. Yeah, I like that one too. I think if pressured to pick a favorite, I'd, I'd go with Bob on uh, Everyone Says I Love You. Um, partly because uh, for a song that is performed so many times in various ways mm -hmm. in that movie, um, 
Harpo makes it um, a whole other thing. He makes it into this uh, wistful, delicate, beautiful, uh, vaguely eerie sounding thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I love what he does with that song. Um, and I don't think I have a least favorite or a harp solo that I don't like, but I, I do have an observation um, which um, connects with your comments about the big store, Bob, which is that in the later MGM films, um, actually pretty much in all the MGM films, there, there seems to have been a choice that Harpo's harp solo is one of the places to create an MGM musical number. Mm-hmm. Um, and Harpo's harp solos in the MGM films tend to have concepts behind them, mm. um, playing the loom in Go West or the mirror thing in, in uh, the big store. Uh, Night in Casablanca, too, although not MGM, has a, a harp solo that is presented as a set piece um, that displays something other than just Harpo's instrumental uh, performance. Mm-hmm. All right, the next thing on my list here is uh, Best Gookie. Um, which uses of the gookie stand out particularly to you? Well, I think because so many of my answers to these questions come from the very start of their film career, for this one, I'll go to the other end and say uh, when he frightens the dog in Love Happy, because it's a lovely close-up. It's I think it's the mm. I think it's the closest one we get. It fills the screen, so I'll I'll go with that one. Well, I'm going to surprise you and go even further than that. I'm going to say from the Incredible Jewel Robbery. What do you think? Ah, that is good too. Yes. I'll tell you yeah. why I like it. Because not only is it a nice laugh, um, 10 minutes into the film, I think it's the first indication we have that this that this is a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a Marx Brothers comedy, no less. Real quickly, number two for me would be uh, from Duck Soup uh, when they come into Trentino's office and he pulls on the mask and he turns around and he has the big gookie on his face. That, that, that's number two for me. Uh, there must be two in Duck Soup, then. Uh, uh, my favorite is in Duck Soup also, but it's in the lemonade stand scene, um, which is um, uh, not generally one of my favorite scenes, but uh, I love the way the gookie is thrown into that scene um, uh, absolutely needlessly. Um, yeah. There are times, like in the Punch and Judy scene in Monkey Business, where the gookie has a narrative role to play. The gookie is a disguise uh, in that scene in Monkey Business. Yeah. Um, but in Duck Soup, it is not necessary. The gookie, he throws it in right at the most at the silliest moment in the hat switching routine, mm-hmm. uh, Edgar Kennedy has taken what appears to be his hat off of Chico's head, but Chico's hat is under it. Chico takes Kennedy's hat. And now Kennedy looks ridiculous in Chico's hat. Yeah. And yeah. he just glances over at Harpo, who just blasts him out of the water with a, a gookie that um, it upsets the momentum of the scene uh, in a in a wonderful way. Um, and, uh, well, I think we're all going to have perhaps predictable answers for this one. Um, what do you think is Harpo's best film performance overall? I'm going to surprise you guys. I actually surprised myself. <laughs> Go on, then. Too many kisses? To be honest, I totally expected to pick Animal Crackers. But uh, looking at the films again, I decided to go with Duck Soup. Uh, He's just so wonderful, and there's so much precision that was needed to pull off those scenes with the lemonade vendor and obviously the mirror stuff and ringing the doorbell. I, I just think he's wonderful in all those, and he just nails everything. So I, I love my Duck Soup Harpo. I, I'm going with that one. Well, mine is no surprise. It would be It would definitely be one of the first two where he is so unpredictable and so dangerous he's almost scary then he has like a sort of a, a static electric crackle every time he, he, he comes on uh, i find it very hard to choose between those first two but i will go with coconuts simply because he's got that beautiful dark wig which i think really sets off his face so beautifully and, and this, this whole mystery about it photographing too dark too dark for what too dark for who <laughs> you know the the groucho's black tail coat surely photographs <laughs> too dark i've never understood it i think that wig looks absolutely gorgeous mm-hmm. all right and uh finally this is uh this is a difficult question i think um because there's there's not that much to work with but um what do you think is harpo's best performance or what's a noteworthy performance that means something to you of harpo's uh outside the 13 marx brothers films 
I'm going with, and believe it or not, this is only like 30 seconds long, but it gives you everything you want. I'm going with Stage Door Canteen. Now, you get 30 seconds of prime Paramount Harpo in like 1942 or 1943. I mean, he magically appears in a phone booth. He's chasing after a girl. He gives somebody his leg. He's pestering some guy for no reason at all. I mean, it's everything you want in Harpo in, in, in 30 seconds. Yeah, it's a little sampler. It's like a Harpo sampler, yeah. a little a little taste of uh, so many of his greatest mm-hmm. hits. Um, although anybody who is disturbed by the girl chasing aspect of his character would probably find that scene uh, a, a little hard to take, partly because it's not a Marx Brothers movie, so we don't have <laughs> the context and atmosphere in which we're used to seeing him. And because he really is sort of sternly told, like, hey, leave her alone, <laughs> um, you know, and, and pr- proceeds not to. Um, I think if you watch that scene in isolation as part of um, the body of work mm-hmm. that we attribute to the Marx Brothers, it's all fine. But I, I wonder if anyone uh, has ever, uh, I'm sure people have watched Stage Door Canteen without knowing much about the Marx Brothers and must just think, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> My choice would be a piece of television because we've spoken a lot about the, the the two harpos the 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 the, the quiet private uh, mm. lovely man and 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 the persona and we're absolutely spoilt for choice uh in terms of uh recordings of his of his comic persona there's not a lot on film of anything even approaching um the, the real Harpo, the family man, the husband. Uh, but there is that very, very lovely Ed Morrow person-to-person interview where mm-hmm. um, he's talking to Susan and, and all the kids are there. Uh, and Harpo is, is just that sort of beatifically stood to one side and, and making... Um, doing kind of very charming physical business like he, he asks uh susan why they they moved out to, to the desert and hoppo mimes uh, a golf swing and and susan gives some other answer and then he shakes his head to no and, and does another golf swing um and you just you just get a, a hint there of 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 the backstage harpo being yeah. being delightful yeah yeah, I think my vote um, might go to uh, Silent Panic, oh, yeah. um, the interesting yeah. Um, yeah. television role that um, we talked about back when we, we did our deep dive into the Marx Brothers TV collection. Uh, Silent Panic is really interesting because he's doing something so different. Um, he doesn't speak, but he plays a completely different character in a completely different kind of piece. Um, and I think it suggests that um, had he wanted to, had he had the ambition to, um, one way he could have grown post Marx Brothers uh, is by taking on different kinds of roles, yeah. um, doing different kinds of things. It gives you a glimpse of just how um, generous his gift was. It is quite striking to think of of how many different things like that he could have done if he had been motivated to to uh, you know to pursue a, a solo career as diligently as as Groucho did. I, I mean, really, the the sky was the limit for him in terms of doing different but but similar things. I was going to say his appearance on I've Got a Secret, but it turned out that was Chico, not Harpo. <laughs> <laughs> could have fooled me. <laughs> My secret is that I can't imitate my brother. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, occasionally in my Marx Brothers adventures, um, particularly when, when playing Groucho, um, I've been told by people uh, with the sweetest intentions, people say something to me like, oh, you know, uh, Groucho would have been so proud of you. Um, and uh, it's a lovely thing to say. It's a lovely thing to hear. Um, but I, I always know in my heart that that's not true. <laughs> Groucho <laughs> would not approve. <laughs> Groucho would have nothing uh, kind or good to say about any of it in all likelihood. That's something we all have to live with. But in contrast to that, when I apply that kind of thinking to Harpo, um, I feel differently. And I feel like um, I can at least dare to hope that Harpo would have liked me. <laughs> and now Bob Gasell will tell us what our closing music is. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a harp solo, but not done by Harpo Marx. It's going to be uh, Gummo playing the harp. And this is from, I think, the sound. <laughs> 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 this is from the soundtrack of uh, Viva Zapata. <laughs>
Oh, wow. It serves me right for thinking I could catch you off guard, Bob. <laughs> and I, I know many fans don't like to hear that often it was really Gummo who was playing the harp. <laughs> That's just the way it goes sometimes. They were family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to Harpo Marx in heaven. You no longer play the harp, nor the piano, for that matter. And you speak every chance you get. But this can't be right. This can't be true. In heaven, no one has to talk, and every word is pure music. Where did I get that idea? Why do I have such an idea? Heaven? I don't know anything about the place. I don't even know if it is a place. For all I know, it's a vegetable. Yet I say it with conviction. I want to go to heaven. I pray to go to heaven. Cause heaven is good. Heaven is peace. Heaven is light. Where the hell do I get these ideas? I don't know anything about heaven, but what I've seen in paintings and read in books. Yet I know it ain't made up. It's real. Heaven is real. Heaven is there. Heaven is waiting to house the righteous. I weep for heaven. Come take me, angels of God. Come take me up to heaven. I say up to heaven, not down. I even know the way. That's how sure I am of it. Take me up, O sweet angels. Take me up to heaven where I can play any instrument. And if Harpo won't play the harp, I will gladly. I'll keep silent and not say a word if Harpo won't. Cause I yearn for heaven. I call for heaven. I weep for heaven. Oh, sweet angels, take me to heaven. The Marx Brothers Council podcast is produced and edited by Bob Gassell. Matthew Cunningham Spucks, the annotated Marx Brothers, and That's Me Groucho are published by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of All Say She Is, is published by Bear Manor Media. For more info on this and all episodes, visit our website at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. Also look for us on Twitter. And for the place to talk Marx and meet fellow fans, join us on the lively Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. See you next time. Um, here's a Harpo anecdote that perhaps not not everyone listening will have, will have already heard a hundred times. It's from it's from a book called uh, Incredibly Strange Films, and it's from an interview with the the great. Um, the great American uh, director of bizarre movies, Ray Dennis Steckler. And he's talking about a time when he was making the movie Ega, which is about um, a reanimated caveman play- played by Richard Keel uh, that comes back to life and, mm. uh, and causes, uh, causes havoc. Um, and he was recalling the, the filming of that. He says, we were making Ega in the hot summer, 120 degrees in the Palm Desert. The producer had told us earlier that we were on private property. And if anybody came up to be careful about what we said, because he didn't want to spend any money to rent grounds or anything out there in the desert. While I was changing the film, all of a sudden, someone came up and said, what are you doing? I turned around and saw this guy about 70 years old. And I said, oh, we're making a little educational film down there. He looked down and said, well, what's that guy doing with the club? I said something like, oh, it's, it's just uh, I was reaching for words. And he's smiling at me. At this point, I was a little naive about how you have to hustle to steal everything in the movie business. And he said, you're making a horror movie or something, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah, sort of. He said, very politely, that's my land, you know that. I said, oh, really? He said, I used to make a few movies myself once in a while. I know what you guys are doing, but that's OK. Be my guest. Have fun, kid. Good luck in your career. And he got in his car and he drove away. The producer came down and said, what did he say? And I said, it's okay. Uh, He said, we could shoot here. The producer said, you know who that was, don't you? I said, well, he looked kind of familiar. He said he was in movies, but I couldn't place him. I didn't recognize the voice. He said, of course not. That was Harpo Marx. (laughs) I first became aware of that film on uh, Mystery Science Theater. (laughs) That's how good it is. Do you think if they had been filming a horror movie on Groucho's property, you think they would have gotten uh, that kind of accommodating response? A very good question, yeah.